you very much. Uh, it's great to be here in Hong Kong. This is my second time only in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm very chilled to be here. I went up to the peak uh, yesterday to see it from, from above. It is a great city you have here. And all in one city, you have a little bit more inhabitants than we have in all of, all of Denmark. So it's a little, about, little, little bit about the density in, 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 in Hong Kong. Well, I'm the founder of uh, 3XN, and I brought Casper, who is uh, the director for GXN. GXN stands for Green, 3XN stands for Three Times Nielsen. And I'm, I'm a Nielsen. <laughs> That's how we started off. Uh, we're going to, we're going to t talk about pushing sustainable innovation to the limit for building design and the people within it. Within it. For us, uh, design and uh, buildings are very much about people. It is mostly about people. It is about how architecture uh, creates behavior for the people around it. That's how and what we design and what are the drivers for our design. A little bit about our office. We are 80, uh, around 80 people sitting in Copenhagen in this loft here, that is our studio, where we have this light ceiling that creates day, day and night, so people don't think about if, it's, if it is day and night and work all around, more or less. And uh, we are a very international team. Uh, I think there's about 20 different nationalities uh, at the office. And we do a lot of modeling. Uh, everything that we do is physically modeled too. I think that's very important to create architecture that way to feel it within your hands. And here you see uh, Fred from California, together with uh, Cheyenne from, uh, from Vancouver, standing and discussing a project that we are right now uh, doing in, uh, in Mumbai. And we feed our staff too. We want to keep them in-house, not go out for lunch. So they communicate and uh, share their knowledge together. I think that's very much part of our philosophy, and that's, I think that's very important for us too. And uh, there's no cell office. I don't have an office. I walk around all the time talking to everybody. It's, it's more or less like a, a university, too, where you always uh, talk with the students. Yes, um, and uh, my name is Kasper. This is uh, the first time that uh, Kim and I am going to do a double lecture like this. So we're going to go in and out, uh, uh, complimenting each other, uh, talking about our projects. Um, and that's also very much the kind of... Um, the thoughts behind having uh, GXN, which is uh, the innovation unit of the company. So uh, we are a group uh, of uh, 10 people where it consists of a mix of architects, engineers, designers, also a psychologist. Um, and we try to uh, have this kind of parallel focus on innovation in architecture. Um, often in uh, practice, uh, you're always focused on the next deadline. You're always on a time schedule that's very tight. We try to have this kind of parallel space where we can take in knowledge from various fields, from various disciplines, uh, and in that way, in GXN work uh, with sustainability, trying to learn from uh, new findings in green technologies, in new materials. Um, so uh, this is uh, what we do uh, parallel to the orphan, I think. I think that's a, a great characteristic to uh, 3XN, that we actually have this kind of capacity to include a lot of other uh, fields. Um, so in our daily basis, we also work with scientists, biologists, chemists, uh, artists. Um, and I think that's what we'll try to do today, try to actually show how we think and work and also how we create synergy to do research and practice. Um, a few years ago, uh, we uh, created our work in an exhibition called Mind Behavior. And it's very much due to uh, our philosophy, uh, our main drive in the office is, is behavior. We believe that buildings can change the way that uh, we work, the way we communicate. Uh, and this relationship between architecture and people um, is, is what drives the office. This exhibition uh, shows 30 of our projects and how uh, they are related to behavior. It's not behavior in a kind of sense where we dictate how people's behavior should be, but more like how architecture physically is uh, supporting and stimulating different kinds of behavior. That's also uh, the coming six chapters in, in this uh, talk uh, where we'd like to uh, take you through uh, some of our works and, and how behavior is this kind of uh, influence in, in all of them. This started actually with um, a building, uh, College building we did in uh, in uh, Copenhagen uh, High School. 
kids from 16 till um, from 15 to 19 years old, where we um, we in Denmark is a small country. How can we compete against China, for example, that educates as many engineers every year as the whole population of UK, about 60 million? And we uh, we have to do it in a different way. We have to do it try to do it in a more creative way. So this idea behind this school is there's no classrooms. Everything is about everything is about uh, communication. Uh, interaction between the students so they learn more for each other. So the challenge was actually to design a building that enhances this uh, communication and this uh, interaction between the students. So we made, made an, an open space, five floor uh, high up, with a staircase in the center of uh, the building where all the students have to walk up. Only the dis disabled people can take the elevators. They have a key for that. All the rest have to take the staircase five floors up and down maybe 10 times a day, they get exercise, but then they communicate too, and they see what is happening in the school and get expired, inspired by each other. So here you see the staircase combining all the different floors. You have an overview when you're standing in the center of the building, and when you come up, you see it more like a cityscape than a normal room by room scape. Uh, the, uh, the inspiration is more maybe from uh, an Italian uh, mountain village than it is from a, uh, another building, sort of. And uh, this is actually how the students uh, work together. There's no books in the school. They, they use laptops all the time, and they work together in groups. And this is how they work when they're at home. So, of course, this is how they like to work here uh, at the school, too. They think very much about this space here as their club. So they actually stay there long after their, uh, their teaching hours. So in the, even if you come there in the evening, they're still uh, Lot of, lots of students at, at the place because they, they take it uh, as a home. Now the school has been working for, for five years uh, and, uh, and, it, it, and it creates the students, as you can see here, maybe not the students with the highest grade, but the students that are really prepared to go out to university and take, and take in knowledge themselves. Um, this school was a big challenge to us because there was a new teaching reform uh, and we uh, were kind of challenged to uh, give an answer to a new way of, uh, of, of learning and teaching, communicating. So as Kim says, like we got rid of all the corridors. We did a lot of new spaces where we uh, had the, the purpose and intention to actually let students uh, learn from each other and let uh, different uh, types of education also uh, refer to each other. So I think all, all architects have a lot of intentions uh, and it's to us, very important also to go out afterwards and also try to test out those intentions. So we are working with the post evaluations of all our buildings. So for example, here in this school right now, we are going out interviewing uh, the students, interviewing the teachers, um, and, and trying to monitor the way that people are moving and communicating. And in that way, I think, uh, we try to uh, create some kind of uh, knowledge that we then can use to improve our future projects. So I think that's important in architecture, also to learn from your buildings after they've been built. Um, so, so this is uh, how we uh, are working with our projects, both uh, during the kind of uh, idea development, but also uh, after the realization of the, the projects, we go back. There's also a, a chapter on, uh, on, on social behavior. And uh, we believe uh, when it comes to buildings uh, where people are working that we can also stimulate the way people work. Uh, people work better together if they have a better insight in what the organization is about, uh, if they know the, the neighbors, if, if they have a, a better touch with the whole organization. So this is a, a, a bank uh, a project where we also are working with a kind of very open space and a lot of visual transparency where we're trying to use uh, different niches in the building for inofficial uh, meetings. Um, and this is a, a, a project that's very characterized by kind of a, a terraced uh, uh, roofscape um, in the layout of the building. Yeah, the building is, um, when we were invited for this competition, most of our projects is uh, competition wins. And this one uh, was as well. And there, there used to be, uh, there used to be uh, the old building at this place here. So when, when we put down the building, this is a saving bank. They say we have to save money, so we have to use as much as possible of the old construction as possible. 
So what we did was to build on top of the old uh, construction and then make this, uh, this landscape that uh, Kasper referred to, where the, the director he comes in the morning and then he goes up and says hello to everybody and everybody feels they are in a team together and they know exactly what is happening in, in their work and they have a, a group feeling together, which is important. But this is a multifunctional building as well. It's more than a bank. It is a community building for the small community as well. This is in a small town, only 15,000 inhabitants, and they have no other community buildings. So we did this little plaza here in the center of the, of the building that is for, for the people of the town to use to exhibitions, small concerts, uh, Christmas uh, parties, and, and whatever. And they really use that. And of course, we wanted to make a very sustainable building to make this roof landscape that is sheltering uh, for, for, the, for the sun and opening up for the view out to, to the water that is this way here. And this is how it, uh, how it looks in reality. So you have, the, you have the water out here, and this is to the, water, to the north, so you don't get any hot sun in, inside the building, but you still have the view out. So when you see it from the nearby bridge, you see this. It's a fairly big big uh, building mass in a smaller community. But when you come down an eye level, you have the scaling of the small town. So it sort of fits in, of course, in another way. It's designed in another way than the old buildings, but still with reference to the old buildings. Especially when you come to the pedestrian street that's on the town side of the, of the building, it uh, sort of blends in with the colors and, and the way that we did it uh, with, the, with the old town. This roofscape, that is there for practical reasons, to uh, shade for the, for the sun and allow view out becomes the indoor uh, decoration at the same time too. Where you're here, you have the public plaza I told, told you about, uh, and up here is all the working places. So uh, the, the roofscape becomes reflectors for daylight and for artificial light in, in the nighttime, and it becomes very much the, the, the mean to give character to the to the whole inside of the building. And as, you sit, as I said, when you come up into the building, you have an overview of the inside landscape. And here you have a situation in a, a weekend where they use uh, the, the open plaza for, for a little concert. In, uh, in many of our projects, you will see that we are working quite expressively with the facade. We're playing a lot with patterns and three-dimensional uh, movement. Um, as Kim said, uh, we always do that to uh, achieve effect, uh, effect of daylight or energy saving, and of, of course also an, an aesthetical uh, expression. Um, what's also interesting is that uh, when we are working with this prefabrication, we actually take uh, the production off-site so we can control the precision and the quality uh, of our buildings. And also, uh, we can ensure a really fast closure uh, of the facade. So in this case, um, the contractor, he actually uh, calculated uh, with three weeks uh, of closing the roof facade. Uh, and in, in reality, it only took three days due to, uh, to this prefabricated, very highly precise uh, elements. That also is the kind of key uh, characteristic uh, of the architectural expression. So there's a lot of synergy. There's a lot of uh, um, also economical savings in, in, in working with the high precision off-site uh, manufacturing. Insight, uh, I'd just like to show, we always work with integrated artwork, uh, sometimes to do it ourselves. This time was in collaboration with uh, Olof Eliasson, uh, who did this uh, wonderful uh, prismatic light. So uh, you have uh, these uh, five meter tall shafts that is being uh, lowered into the ceiling that works with uh, reflecting mirrors as a kaleidoscope. And in, in that way, uh, it actually is a reflection of the roofscape and the architecture that becomes the art. Um, a real good example of, of, of integrated art in, in, in our projects. I'd like also to, uh, to talk about responsible behavior. And uh, it's because we think uh, talking about sustainability should be uh, fun. It should be a challenge. It, it should be something that we, uh, we see as a positive challenge and a way to actually change our buildings and the way we do architecture in order to actually uh, embed sustainability uh, as an integrated feature. So uh, you could say that uh, uh, sustainability becomes a kind of uh, an aesthetical expression as well. Um, this is a project in, uh, in Copenhagen. It's a uh, headquarter for a law company. Um, and uh, you see also here we're working with this kind of relief, with movement in the facade. Uh, 
as uh, also with uh, the previous project, here when you kind of move around the building and see it from south, it becomes very close, uh, and you want to have a close facade towards south, uh, south to prevent overheating of the building. And then like, even in winter when it's cold, you actually use a lot of energy normally uh, to cool down your buildings. Uh, by doing this, uh, we are creating this kind of natural solar shading uh, as a part of the geometry. When you move around the building and see it from north, it opens up. It's also where you have the view to the water. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of great features here. I mean, we are, are using this uh, to actually lower the energy consumption of the building by 15%, just by playing with the geometry and the aesthetic. We are also creating small uh, bay windows for the attorneys uh, standing uh, on the inside, framing the view. Uh, and at the same time, uh, working like this, we are also creating an expression in the building so it appears more like a, a, a mountain facade, uh, a new kind of uh, architectural uh, uh, form language. So to do that was also a challenge in, in ways uh, we were again working with uh, off-site manufacturers, but uh, due to the complexity of the facade, we, uh, we were looking at uh, working with concrete or steel or more like traditional solutions. Uh, but we chose to actually uh, use the uh, material that is being used in Denmark for windows. So we worked with uh, glass fiber composites, these kind of uh, sandwich balls that you also know for surfboards. Doing that, we are actually working with a very lightweight material it also has a potential to actually uh, be molded in different geometries. So, so working with this, we are getting a lightweight facade that weighs 80% uh, less than a normal steel structure. And at the same time, uh, has very low uh, corrosion. It has very low heat capacity. Um, and, and that way, uh, also opens up to, to new building materials in architecture. On the inside again, I mean, we are really keen to have these central uh, parts of our buildings uh, with the staircases where you can have these kind of uh, visual uh, transparencies and connections inside the building. This is the building from night time where you see the, the sun come out, uh, light come out. That leads to uh, another behavior. This is all about behaviors. Human behavior. Uh, what makes uh, people choose this path? Um, this is an aquarium. And uh, most aquariums I see around the world doesn't look like what's inside. They look maybe like factory or villa or whatever. They don't tell the story from outside. When we were invited to this competition, we were struggling very hard to um, come up with an idea that got people down into the water. And uh, we were working seven weeks for the competition. And it took five, after five weeks, uh, a person came in, I can't remember who it was, with this picture here. And that, was, that became the idea of the driving factor for the design of the building. So we, uh, we, were, we were very uh, focused on this about, this about uh, choosing your own path. So we wanted you to come into the center of the building, and then we could choose which, uh, which aquarium you could go to. And you, if you put that into that shape, you get this, this kind of shape. And funny enough, it has a little bit of reference to, uh, to your flat here, we realized when you came over here. So, uh, what we say, uh, we want to keep the energy in the, in, in the middle and then have a dynamic form. So this is actually uh, your flag too. Your flag shows a, a, a dynamic, dynamic uh, society. Uh, but anyway, back to the project here again. Here we have uh, the different aquariums. Here's the hot water, and here's the tropical forest, uh, restaurant, and the uh, Nordic Sea. And you, you come into the center and then you can choose your way. You actually walk down into to the water here because you pump water from the real sea to, the, to these basins up here and you can walk down to the center. So we want this feeling of our being on the water when you come in. So we work, work in the in the free space, we work with the light artists that created this feature here in the ceiling so you really feel now we're on the water and you have a sound, the man inside too that is working with sounds, underwater sounds. So you get, we really say it's the whole, whole experience about being in the water. This building is going to be finished in a couple of months, so now it's coming up. It has been quite a struggle to build this building for a just ordinary uh, budget. This is more or less a budget for a, a more square building we have. But we are succeeded in doing it a little bit under the budget and within the time frame we have. So it's going to open up here to, to master for the holiday, when all the kids have uh, school, school holiday. That, that's going to be an important time for 
for, for the opening day for the, for the third year. It's a place next to the Copenhagen Airport, Airport Castle. I can see the planes passing by here. So you will see it from this angle here, up in, up in the air. So the fifth facade here has been extremely important in, in the building as well. Uh, and this leads, leads to the next behavior, public behavior. How do we lay an urban, plan, urban environment for, for, for people? Uh, I have a couple of examples here for, for that. We have done a cultural building in a small town in, in, us, in Norway called uh, Molde. And here's the view of Molde and how it lays out to the, to the water. We actually got the worst site in, this, in the town. There was a pit in the middle of the town where there was a sort of a, yeah, there was 10 uh, meters difference from here to here. And I was dividing the, the town up in two parts. So what we decided to do was to form the whole building as one big staircase, we love staircase, and this is actually the building as a big staircase. And the thing is, if this is a building for jazz concerts too, and they have a jazz festival every summer. So uh, in the summertime, they can use all the outside areas for, for different kinds of stages. So this is early in the morning, and this is later in the day. We want our building, as buildings, as, as we say, to enhance behavior and enhance uh, interaction between people. And here you can see this is what they do too. They uh, they really make uh, people meet and 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 s uh, sit here together at, at, at the circuit. We just won a competition half a year ago for an arena in Copenhagen. We call it A plus, a little bit like the M plus that's coming here. The plus stands for more than an, an, an arena, as the museum is going to be in. The, Hong Kong as well. Uh, our idea was to create a, an arena, not like the normal arenas that are outside the city to be parking lot around, but more uh, an arena like this one here in Verona, uh, that is just in the center of the city, and have uh, city life, like here in Copenhagen, we have all the restaurants, city life around it. So we think about this as a cultural building in the new center of Copenhagen. This is a new town in Copenhagen. Where we're, where we're doing this. So it is a quite a difficult situation to put a big arena for 16,000 people in a, a new area where you're going to have uh, housing uh, and office spaces around it and parking buildings out here. So <clears throat> what we did was to divide it up in two parts. The lower part here will uh, create different kinds of plazas and staircases, as we like staircases, where you move people up so you don't have to move people down. Um, uh, further up when you too many too much further up when you come inside the building and you can use these staircases here as same for for activities around the building. So I have uh, this this small film here showing the the ideas uh, behind the, the design. So we say we uh, we uh, make a plant that is the lower part of the building is scaling the whole building down so it has a scale, it has a human scale uh, and more blending into the, uh, the lower landscape and the lower uh, building environment around it. Then we put the big ball on top of that with the, with the arena and have staircases up that shows clearly where the entrance is so we don't need uh, very much science to find a way around it. Uh, the client wanted because it's in Copenhagen, a very Nordic uh, arena. So the Nordic idea and the view is more this way to work with the, with the facades resembling, resembling uh, a forest and wood, which is, uh, which is of course, very Nordic with pine trees around. When you come in, it's a whole setting at area. area. It's, it's very open to the surroundings, so you can see what is happening outside when you walk around, and then you come into the boat. That, that is like a traditional uh, way more or less it has all the facility that's needed. But what is important for us for this building here is that it functions well when it's not it doesn't have any inside. That it has this kind of activities with restaurants and uh, here on a warm summer night that happens too in Denmark sometimes. Where you can sit outside and you have the and you have the restaurants in, inside here. Hey. Uh, the small classes as, as I talk about outside where you can use these staircases are sense for uh, this kind of activities outside and to the other side where there's going to be a park. Uh, this is towards the south where you can use the staircases as well for uh, if you're leaving sunshine or you can use these uh, plazas for uh, the restaurant areas.
the last one here, uh, it's very much about uh, materials. We work a lot with materials, trying to see how actually material science opens up for a lot of ways to uh, work with new materials and also use materials to work sustainably. Uh, the first example is uh, kind of a, a, an odd example uh, because we're working with mushrooms. Uh, and right now, uh, today, uh, mushrooms or fungus is something that you would like to keep out of your building. Uh, but we also uh, see that the potential, actually, the roots of, um, of mushrooms can bind together leftover material from agriculture and, uh, and work as a living organism. So in, in that way, you can actually start to grow materials and materials that require no energy in the making and that is 100% uh, sustainable and biodegradable and that you can design to be compact, soft, acoustical, um, insulating. Um, Saying this is a kind of a parallel research project to uh, the work we do. We do this with a lot of different uh, uh, materials. So, so maybe mushrooms is a kind of new uh, insulation material for tomorrow. Um, it leads me to uh, talk a bit about uh, life cycle design uh, because we need to see the buildings uh, that we are, are, are doing and uh, are living in uh, as a part of uh, an ecosystem. Normally you talk about uh, sustainability in a, in a fashion where you are wanting to minimize the CO2, you want to minimize uh, energy consumption, you want to minimize waste production. Um, and funny enough, I mean, uh, a word like waste doesn't exist in nature. Uh, waste and pollution is, is some uh, man-made phenomenon. And, and, and I think that's a challenge to us as architects. Uh, in architecture, why should architecture be uh, part of a problem? It should be a part of a solution. So this last project is a, a good example on uh, how we are trying to work with, in this case, a lot of living materials. It's an agricultural high school uh, where the students are being prepared uh, for agricultural university. So there's a lot of different ways to uh, do urban agriculture. Uh, and the client wants us to include a lot of living uh, plants, uh, solutions, for example, on the outside, working with uh, green uh, roof, uh, roofs and green walls. Uh, and doing that, we would like to be more specific about what plants we're using. So for the past two years, we've together with biologists and immunologists and ontologists, worked uh, with uh, kind of uh, selecting 400 wild species. Uh, so the plants that we are working with in this project actually is the same that is a part of the biological context uh, of the project. And in, uh, in the facade, for example, we're working with algae. So we would like to have like a, a, a green solar shading. And algae is a kind of a, a living organism as well. And, and doing that, uh, we have a water in, in the window panes and uh, algae is living there. And, and during the day, uh, they kind of uh, uh, grow and uh, the water gets green at noon. And in that way, it actually works as a solar shading. I think this is interesting. This is a kind of a new expression. But also, it allows us to take a lot of the energy from the water and also the biomass from the algae uh, in order to put back into the building. So combined with a lot of other uh, plant features where we also purifying the water in the building, producing food for the building, we're actually getting a building that is giving more than it takes, a building that's producing oxygen, uh, a building that's producing energy, food, uh, a building that's filled with materials that are recyclable, uh, and in that way, try to actually establish itself as a kind of uh, architectural answer to uh, a man-made ecosystem. So I think uh, this, as a last slide, buildings that integrate with nature and kind of uh, gives answers to, uh, to sustainable uh, questions uh, in, in this fashion is, is a great vision and uh, is our kind of uh, last picture for today. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much.